services, and this needs to be improved as well. Childcare protection on their services, and this needs to be improved as well. Childcare professionals do not understand the internet or online related issues. They need to collaborate and understand it as well, and that can only happen if they speak to the other stakeholders to create a common understanding of what the problems are and being able to order, identify the solutions. NGOs have the same problem. Inaxo is actually a tool to heighten the quality of the NGOs in countries that are in need of this so that we can create um, substantial capacities and expertise in these countries so that country uh, is able to act upon um, the loopholes and the challenges that are here. Academic institutions, same thing. General public, we all know that in order for general public to actually adopt things, they need to have confidence in it. Sometimes two or three stories that comes up with children being sexually exploited or any other sort of uh, financial fraud, like scams um, and phishing, they might deter people from actually uh, to engage with this uh, tool called online services or e-services in general, and that's not really helpful. Um, so they need to be in the discussion as well, and whoever's collaborating on this issue needs to sort of also depict what real problems are here and what solutions can be brought um, to improve it. As I mentioned before, we are creating a um, cross-ministerial um, task force together with stakeholders, and we see this as one of the key issues in order to be able to create this common playing field where we all understand what we're talking about and we all agree in terminology and we find solutions where all stakeholders are involved. Just to mention three ministries that are basically currently involved in this Ministry of ICT. Um, of course, they regulate the internet, they have insight into it, and they actually oversee the implementation of, of different services. So they are key to this, but very often they don't understand issues related to child online protection. So they would need to come in and understand what we're doing, uh, and we would need to inform them. And the dialogue will also put on the table new developments and how we can go in, and instead of creating possibly laws, we are able to put in measures in place to regulate or self-regulate or co-regulate. Ministry of Education, very often in the school curricula, internet safety is not there at all. It might be there on a one-off occasion, and I'm not talking just about Denmark or the United Kingdom or Germany. I think it's pretty much almost global. Although I know in Singapore, for instance, or in Asian countries, certain Asian countries, they do have internet safety classes and weeks and themes and so forth, but it's lacking in the majority uh, of the global community. I think it's important that children who are adopting technology very, very fast, that they actually also are given the tools and empowered to use them in a proper, positive and constructive way. And this needs to be done in the school. That's the easiest way to get hold of all the children because sooner or later, in the majority of the world, uh, they will go through a school system. Ministry of Justice, certain countries that don't define the internet and as such is not able to punish crimes that are happening on the internet. It happens in a jurisdiction that is not defined by themselves. So hence, criminals will seek these countries and use these loopholes to actually commit crimes based basing their services in these countries and be able to get away from it without actually having to face um, trial on it. Currently, one of the major challenges in Europe um, is actually trying to, to find lead legal ex instruments to address the challenges of grooming of children for sexual exploitation. This will possibly uh, have an effect in other countries as well, but this is just you know, challenges for the, for the European sphere. Um, another ch big challenge is basically being able to exchange information on certain types of criminals who can uh, be acting across borders. So a bit that was mentioned earlier today as well. So basically, to summarize, the multi-stakeholder collaboration is key. Multi mutual understanding of problems uh, is necessary in order to create the appropriate measures to address them. International collaboration, like the uh, ITU's Child Online Protection Initiative, is really crucial. It reaches beyond uh, regions like the European Union or Latin American states or African unions and so forth. It, has, it actually does create the global platform of dialogue and hopefully actions. An appeal. Many lessons have been learned. 
by colleagues, my colleagues, your colleagues. Um, it's not necessary to go out and reinvent the wheel. Most of the information is already at hand. Be open-minded, talk to them, seek for advice. Um, it's the best thing we can do because everybody has a responsibility and we need to act upon it. And the more we wait, the more damage we actually are witnessing. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dieter, also for the you know really good some summary of, <laughs> of the concept. And as a matter of fact, I mean I, I will not uh, provide any time in uh, comments and notes, but uh, this is the, 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 there was something interesting that you said that is related to the loopholes. I mean in the legal in the legal framework, this is a problem that is really really, I mean uh, something to be to be properly addressed because the harmonisation of legal framework I think is some one of the main issues to be to be addressed. I mean in any areas that are related to to sub to cybercrime and this is something that uh, I mean that you is trying to do through the different initiatives through the global cybersecurity agenda which is you know our let's say strategic framework for 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 addressing cybersecurity so uh, this is something that we are trying to do as, as an intergovernmental organization in collaboration with governments, with the other institutions, with other international organizations and I'm glad that I mean you mentioned that because um, it, it is one of the main, it is really one of the main objective that we had to achieve. So uh, I now pass the floor to John. Just a little introduction. He's the secretary of the UK's Children Charities Coalition and Internet Society. Cheers. Cheers. Right? That's it. Okay. <laughs> which is uh, comprising the UK's major professional child welfare organization. So uh, we have, I have a pleasure to work with him, as I said, in, in the past. Uh, we had, uh, from the development set to organize the, uh, well, we, we organize a series of, uh, of uh, cybersecurity forums around the world, regular cybersecurity forum to, to, to build capacity on cybersecurity. And uh, there was uh, an at specific attention also, I mean, within uh, some of the regions in Africa, specifically within the, the Comesa region on uh, addressing some of the issues on child and protection and, and we, we invited in and we start collaborating so we want to carry on with this so please thank you very much The end. Thank you. That was quick. Okay, good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm John Carr, as you just heard, and I'm the secretary of the Children's Charities Coalition on Internet Safety in the United Kingdom. And I'm going to focus specifically in uh, my talk this morning on child abuse images, child pornography, child sex abuse images. People call these things different. Uh, by different names in different countries, but uh, clearly what we clearly are talking about are uh, images which depict children being sexually um, abused and the way in which the internet has completely and absolutely changed the, uh, the nature of the market, in inverted commas, for child sex abuse images. We, um, we had a very uh, distinguished uh, person in the United Kingdom called Sir William Utting, who did an inquiry in, uh, which was published in 1997. Uh, it was called People Like Us, and it was looking into uh, some very bad cases of child abuse that had taken place in orphanages uh, in the United Kingdom. And it was clear that it had been uh, organized by a, a ring of paedophiles who were recruiting each other to work in different orphanages just so that they could get access to children. And uh, part of what they were also doing was exchanging uh, child pornogra pornographic images between each other. And Sir William Utting looked at the state of uh, the market, as I say in inverted commas, for child pornographic images then, 1996, 1997. And what he said was, before the internet came along, the availability uh, of child pornographic images was similar to that which you would get in a cottage industry. In other words, before the internet came along, according to this distinguished scholar and expert on child abuse images, he said that um, if you wanted to get hold of child pornographic images, um, it was quite difficult. 
actually to do it. Uh, you had to know somebody who already possessed them. You had to be part of, for example, a, a, a ring of paedophiles who were interested in child pornography. And if you weren't part of that group, in reality, it was quite hard for you to find the images and get hold of them. What he said, however, what he also went on to say, however, was the way in which the internet had completely changed that and changed it from being this rather difficult, this rather small industry, cottage industry, as he put it, into what somebody else later called a multi-billion dollar global industry. And uh, we also had, around the same time, 1995, in fact, to be precise, uh, the, the police force in Greater Manchester, Manchester is a big city in the, uh, the north of England, they've got a rather second-rate football team that some of you may have heard of. Um, I'm from Leeds, by the way, so I ought to just make that clear, declare an interest. Um, the, the Manchester police in 1995 counted the total number of child pornographic images which they confiscated in that year. Now, 1995 was probably the last year <coughs> of the old world, at least in, in, in Britain. In other words, from about 1996 onwards, we began to see a huge increase, a huge explosion, really, in the take-up of, of the internet in the UK. So 1995 was an interesting year for the Greater Manchester Police to count the total number of images which they would child pornographic images which they confiscated, uh, and the total number in that year was 12. That's a dozen. And all of the images which they seized were on bits of paper. Um, four years later, the same police force, covering exactly the same area, same population, arrested one man who in his possession had one and a half million uh, child pornographic images. Now that, you know, let's be clear, a lot of those images were repeat images, they weren't all unique and different images, but nonetheless that gives you some idea of the way in which the advent of the internet has completely changed the, the volume of child pornographic images in circulation. And let's also not forget that behind the images lie children who are being sexually abused with the dire, dire consequences for them that, that we all know about from other, other research. So, um, you heard um, in the introduction that I work with this group of children's charities in the UK called CHIS. The, these are the logos of all of those charities. Some of these charities are extremely well known, household names in reality in, in the United Kingdom. And what we have found certainly uh, in, in the UK is that when all of the big children's organisations come together and speak with one voice, as we've managed to do around the issues of child protection, uh, the media have to listen, and that means the government have to listen. And when we work alongside parliamentarians like Alan Michael, who's been a, a great activist and a great friend to the child protection cause in Parliament, it certainly, in my opinion, adds greatly to our impact and our, and our effectiveness. And we're working, uh, as uh, Dieter mentioned earlier now, in a European alliance with all of these different countries at the moment in membership, where we're trying to, as it were, replicate the same uh, kind of thing um, as, as we've already been doing in the UK. Um, I'm going to focus specifically on some of the international dimensions of dealing with uh, child pornography, child sex abuse images, because obviously we're here at a global conference. And a lot of the, the data that you're going to hear from me now, I have to acknowledge, is, a, is the product of a wonderful piece of research by the International Center for missing and exploited children in the United States of America. They did a, a big global survey of the state of laws and, uh, in this field, which they published, I think it was about two years ago now. And what they found, what they found then was that there were still uh, over 80 uh, countries, in fact, I think it was nearly 90 countries in the world, where there was still no specific law, no specific reference to the existence of child pornography at all, whether online or offline. Now, admittedly, some of those countries would use their general obscenity laws to uh, arrest, and conf arrest people who are peddling child pornography and confiscate it from them. But it's certainly our, our view, it's certainly my view, that if you don't have a specific law that, that refers 
in very clear terms to child pornography as being an offence and giving the police specific powers to act in relation to it, then it can, it can tend to slip down uh, the agenda. Because if you haven't got a specific law, equally you don't have a specific focus on it. Very often there will be no crime statistics, for example, which will, can be published to monitor the effectiveness of police action in this field. And so we regard having a law which specifically refers to child pornography as being an important building block in any uh, legally based strategy for dealing with this issue. There are still uh, over 20 countries in the world where it is technically impossible to commit any, any kind of crime online because there is no mention in their national laws of cyberspace as having any kind of legal existence. So, in, for example, in the UK, we've got the Computer Misuse Act. We've got a number of different pieces of law which make it clear that it's just as possible to commit an offence in cyberspace or in relation to a computer as it is in the real world. And this has uh, obviously very, very definite consequences because clearly these are not countries that don't have access to the internet, they do have access to the internet. And organized criminal groups who are very heavily involved in the production of child pornography are, are aware of these legal loopholes and can shift material there without having to worry about the legal consequences. Um, uh, I'll give you an example of one of the, uh, some of the things that can happen if you don't have a law in relation to, uh, which defines cyberspace. There were, in one country, uh, two young men, well there were hundreds of thousands, millions of young men playing this online game in which you could either buy weapons, you know, with a credit card uh, to use in the game or you could get these weapons by being very good at the game and building up points that won you a weapon. And if you got this new super strong laser gun, you could then obviously kill more people or kill more of your enemies in the game online and in the end you could end up as the champion and so on. Well anyway, what happened in this particular case was uh, one, of, one of these young men hacked into the online account of the other young man and stole his weapon and took it back to his own account. So he then had this master weapon that could enable him to be the champion of, uh, of the world in, in this particular game. The other guy found out who it was who had stolen his weapon. And he got on uh, a train and a bus, and he went, because the guy lived in the same country as him, he went round to his house and he killed him, he murdered him, stabbed him to death with a knife. Uh, now when the guy was caught, the police were able to charge him with the murder, obviously there was a body there on the floor in the real world, so there was no question uh, about the murder, but they weren't able to charge him with theft, the theft of the of the weapon or the other damage done on the online system because there was nothing in their legal framework that would have allowed them to make a charge. Now, I, I acknowledge that charging somebody with theft when there's a murder charge on, uh, on the table as well is perhaps not so important, but it makes the point that uh, without a specific legal framework uh, to act within, then clearly uh, in dealing with internet child pornography, the police are going to be at a severe uh, disadvantage. One of the key uh, tools, one of the key instruments which has emerged in the fight against uh, child pornography on the internet are hotlines. Essentially these are civil society constructions in Britain, ours is called the Internet Watch Foundation. I was a director of it for the first seven years of its life. And this enabled members of the public, anybody at all, uh, to report any abusive images which they find on the internet the hotline then investigates to see if it is illegal or not, and if it is, it reports it to the police, and in the case of the UK, uh, it would report it to the internet service provider whose service, server it was on, and then providing the internet service provider remove that image expeditiously, that's generally understood to mean within 24 hours, although by and large it's usually within an hour, uh, then no criminal liability arises in relation to the internet service provider. Well. There are still only 31 of these hotlines um, covering the, the whole of the world. Uh, there isn't a hotline at all for, in the Arabic language, for example. So it is a gap. It's a gap that needs to be uh, filled. Every country, or certainly every region, certainly every major linguistic group ought to have at least one hotline to which they could report these images if they're found uh, by any of their citizens. There are still only round about 30 uh, police forces in the world 
that have the technical knowledge and the expertise to take part uh, in international police actions on cybercrime. This also is extremely important, uh, and the criminals and the people who uh, work with child pornography are perfectly well aware of those countries where the police have, no, have had no training or have got very little equipment to enable them to participate in any kind of international police action. Um, uh, so that's another issue that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, if we're going to have a, oh, hang on a minute, have a consistent strategy for dealing with this. There is, um, the police have uh, understood very well the, uh, the global nature of uh, the way child pornography on the internet is working and they've created uh, a new body called the Virtual Global Task Force. Um, uh, but it still only has five countries in membership of it. Those are the UK, the USA, Canada, Australia, and Italy. Uh, Interpol is, ob is obviously, Interpol is also part of it. Uh, the Germans, uh, the Japanese, and the Swedes, the Swedish police are, are lining up to become members, but it's been in existence now for nearly four years, and it still only has five national police forces in it. We definitely need to strengthen that because uh, that institution and get more national police forces to join because that's a very practical way in which the police can coordinate their action and work together fighting not just against child pornography I might say in this case but also against online uh, sexual predators who are looking for children in chat rooms and on social networking sites and so on. Um, <clears throat> Alan mentioned earlier about um, the way in which different countries are now beginning to block access to known child pornographic websites. I'll explain how this works in the UK because it's essentially the same in the other country. Mexico, Canada, uh, Finland, Norway, Denmark, Italy, there are, there are a number of countries who are now doing the same, uh, the same sort of thing. Basically what happens is this, uh, the hotlines that I referred to earlier, in the case of Britain it's the Internet Watch Foundation, they maintain a list of all of the child pornography websites uh, any, that they know about anywhere in the world. They maintain a list of those sites. That list is given over to internet service providers in the UK and they use that list to block any access to those sites. So if somebody in the United Kingdom types in uh, an address of one of those uh, websites, they will not be able to get access to it. They will either get a message telling them that they're trying to access an illegal child pornography website, and if they persist in doing this, they will be committing a criminal offence. Or some companies, what they do, rather than confirm the existence of the website, they will simply send you an error 404 message. So it will be as if you've mistyped the address or, and, or, or the address doesn't exist. Um, this is, how, this is one of the measures which has made a big difference to the availability of child pornography in the UK. I think Alan mentioned earlier that when we first started keeping records of this uh, back in 1996, it was just over 18% of all of the child pornography that was being found and reported in the United Kingdom was being published from within the United Kingdom. That's to say it was being housed on servers that were physically located within the geographical boundary of the United Kingdom. Today it's less than 0.2%. Uh, um, and we think that's uh, quite a good achievement. It doesn't mean, by the way, just to be clear, that if, if we had somebody in Britain who was very determined to get access to those child pornography websites, they could still do that. But they'd have to log on to a, a, a server overseas that requires some technical knowledge and some determination, uh, and then log in to the child pornography sites from that overseas server. And I'm sure that there are some guys in Britain who are doing that. But for the overwhelming majority of the British public, effectively, the, all of those known child pornography websites are no longer inaccessible. Now this is very important as far as we're concerned, because most of the people who are involved in producing these commercial uh, these commercial websites uh, of child pornographic images, they're doing it for the money. Then they're, not ne all, they're not necessarily paedophiles themselves, they're gangsters, they're criminals, and they're making the images to sell them because they want the money. If you can stop them reaching their potential customers, they will stop making the images, and that means fewer children will be abused, 
And from a child protection perspective, of course, that's a very desirable um, end result. It doesn't solve the problem completely. We would never say that for one minute, but we think it definitely makes an important contribution uh, to dealing with the problem, and we would like uh, to urge other countries to consider doing something similar. Uh, moving on, um, there are still uh, significant variations between countries, both in the substantive law and in the field of sentencing. For example, um, one country might define child pornography uh, in a very um, strict way, a very narrow way. Other countries might have a broader definition uh, of child pornography. Um, and where you've got that difference in law, it can, make, it can make it difficult for police forces to cooperate. One of the consequences of this is, is very practical and very obvious to state. What you find in reality is that the police, when they work together on child pornography cases internationally, tend to focus on images of, of prepubescent children. Uh, that's to say, children up to the age of nine, 10, uh, or that, that kind of age, uh, and younger. They tend to avoid, I'm not saying this is, I'm not, this is not a criticism, let us be completely clear, I am not making a criticism of the police. When you've got an infinite amount of work to do, you're obviously going to select the bits that are easier to do. So if you pick uh, ca your cases in relation to images of prepubescent children, you're not going to get into any difficult arguments in a courtroom about whether or not the child could have been old enough to have consensual sex with a person uh, because clearly with a prepubescent uh, child that question is never going to uh, arise. But it isn't satisfactory uh, because teenage, young teenagers have got as much of a right to protection as, uh, as very young children. But the practical consequences of differences in the substantive law are that the police in practical terms will focus on the cases which are frankly easier to get through the courts. Similarly in the field of sentencing. If you are caught in the United States of America in possession of any number of child pornographic images, there is a very, very strong likelihood that you will go to jail. Certainly if you're charged at federal level, you will almost certainly end up in jail, and you'll be in jail for at least five years. And in, fi and in the United States, five years means five years. In the United Kingdom, if you get caught with child pornographic images in your possession for the, on a first offence, unless they are a very large number of extreme images, there's almost no chance that you will go to jail. Uh, in some countries, uh, the it's still a felony, it's still a serious crime in, in the United Kingdom, but in some countries, uh, the possession of child pornography is regarded as a, a misdemeanor, and you will get, you know, slap on the wrist uh, and told to go away and not, and not do it again. So there are important differences in sentencing, and this is important as well, because if you, are a if you are a criminal and you behave rationally, then obviously you're going to pick a country to, to house your images or to conduct your business where the law regards these types of offences as being less severe than other ones. I mean, you have, we have to work on the assumption that criminals behave rationally at some point or another. They, I know they don't always, but that is uh, something. There are, also, there are also important procedural differences in the way police forces approach cases and gather evidence, which again can, can make it more and more difficult to work at an international level when trying to deal with internet crime. Bear in mind, here we're talking about child pornography, only child pornography. Now, if th there may not be an another issue on the planet where everybody is in agreement on that child pornography is a bad thing and that it shouldn't be there and that we should do everything we can to get rid of it. And yet, I am still able to recite to you here in this talk this morning lots of ways in which international cooperation for practical purposes does not exist. And if we can't get it right in relation to child pornography, it seems to me we have quite a, a challenge getting it right into a, in, in a number of other areas. Um, still, the majority of images, uh, child sex abuse images, that are available on the internet are being published out of the USA. And again, let me remind you what that means is that the uh, images are housed on servers which are physically located within the jurisdictional, the geographical boundaries of the United States. 
We know this because since 1996, the UK's Internet Watch Foundation has been tracing every image that it's, that's reported to it. Um, and as I've said, in every year since then, uh, the majority of images have come out of the USA. Now, I want to make it clear, by the way, that one of the reasons for this is that the USA has the largest physical capacity for hosting um, I images on, uh, on the Internet or providing Internet services. And, um, you know, the USA does a huge amount of work in combating child sex abuse images and, and child sexual predators on the internet and, and you know US law enforcement are you know they put millions and millions of dollars and millions and millions of man hours into dealing with this uh, but that fact remains nonetheless and it's partly a product of their laws partly a product of the, the fact that the physical infrastructure exists uh, I'm, I'm, nearly, I'm nearly at the end of my uh, remarks now um, the banks, and the, um, the banks and, and the credit card companies have been coming together and working together very well um, through something called the Financial Coalition, which has existed now in the USA for several years, and we're now trying to recreate a, or create a similar version of it in Europe for the European banks and, and the European-based credit card companies. Uh, and what they've, because I'm talking principally here, by the way, unless I made it clear, earlier about the commercial sa the sale of child pornography over the internet, commercial sale of these images, which was initially at any rate facilitated almost entirely by, through the use of credit cards, Visa and, and MasterCard. Well obviously Visa and MasterCard didn't want this, uh, it was very bad for their corporate image, it was specifically against their terms and conditions of service, uh, but they didn't at the time have a very effective mechanism for policing it. The financial institutions led by Visa and MasterCard, again, have put millions and millions of dollars and man hours into stamping this out. And they're doing this through the vehicle of the, of the financial uh, coalition that I mentioned uh, earlier. But it, it, the, the, the criminals involved in this are very clever. They move around a lot. They move very fast. And they, they are still finding ways to get paid. So it's really important that the financial coalition uh, carries on with this work because, as I said earlier, if we can stop these guys getting the money, then the trade, a large part of the trade, will essentially dry up and vanish, and that means fewer children will be abused. Now, I was, you might have thought I was then saying, well done, the financial institutions, and by and large, that is what I intended to say. However, they have recently made what I consider to be a huge blunder. Um, in the UK and, uh, and a number of other countries, uh, including the USA and so on, you may have seen them, uh, these credit cards with V, well, they're not credit cards, strictly speaking, but they've got the Visa and MasterCard logo on them. And in the UK you, and in the USA, you can buy them for cash. You can walk into a shop, hand over 50 pounds, 80, 90 US dollars, used to be more. Um, you hand over 50 pounds and get a card that utilizes the Visa or MasterCard payment system on the internet and, read, and essentially be able to buy things anonymously. I have bought one of these cards. I registered myself as Mickey Mouse. I gave my address as Buckingham Palace. Um, and I was able, nonetheless, to get through the system and then use the card uh, uh, over the internet. And that's a really kind of counterproductive measure because it, what it means is that people can could go on the line, go on the internet, and buy things anonymously. Um, and, and it sets back, I think, a lot of the good work that, that the financial institutions were doing. I don't know how many of you in the room um, remember Operation Or. It's, it was called Operation Landslide in the USA when it first started against um, a, company called, a company called Landslide that was in Texas. And they seized the they seized the servers from this company, and found on on those servers the names of quarter of a million men who had bought child pornographic images using their credit cards, and 7,200 of these men were in the United Kingdom, and so the P American police gave this list of people to the British police, who were then able to go and arrest several thousand of them. Uh, they, not all of them were arrested for for a variety of reasons, but. Uh, four or five, I think it was four and a half thousand, nearly five thousand of them. The police came to their door, seized their computers, and uh, over three thousand of them were, were were convicted. Well, Operation Or would would never hap would never have been able to happen 
if these anonymous credit cards had been in existence because the guys would never, presumably, would never have used their own credit card. They would simply have gone round to the local petrol station or grocery sh sh stop, a shop, bought one of these credit cards anonymously, used it online and got exactly the same material. So it seems to me that the, the emergence of these prepaid credit cards uh, as it is definitely undermining some of the excellent work that the banks and financial institutions have been doing to combat the trade in child pornographic images. So, um, uh, in conclusion, what I, what I would just say, a lot has been achieved in the field of combating child pornography internationally over the internet, but there's a lot, much, has, much has been done, but there's much still to be done. And in this, I think parliamentarians do have a, a, a key role to play. Um, because we need pressure on governments, we need pressure on national institutions uh, to get the kind of international cooperation that's necessary to see an end to this trade. And parliaments around the world, they all have different powers and different structures and so on, but by and large parliaments and parliamentarians therefore are a key bit of the civil society in a way that, that helps to achieve progressive changes in the law. And in that, of course, there is a, a particularly important role that the ITU can play in reaching out to parliamentarians, supporting them, briefing them, and helping them with, with that task. Thank you. you know, because it's related to what, what John was saying in terms of uh, collecting information. I think that gathering uh, basic information in terms of statistics, in terms of trends, I mean, it's, it's also essential, I mean, uh, to try to address properly. And uh, this is something that the different organizations are now starting to do. Also, obviously, ITU, I mean, uh, being me a little bit more involved in, the, in this community is doing. And there was a recent statistic on, uh, on this and, and specifically on the usage of, uh, of ICT by ch children and youth and uh, basically and uh, yes and, and young people and uh, you can see there that there are specific uh, let's say range of age that are you know accessing ICTs specific services that are used uh, uh, specific modalities so through this um, kind of initial assessment, I mean, we can really identify what are, where, what are, where are the areas, so what are the issues that really need to be addressed, I mean, from the different perspective, from the legal part, from the, 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 the technical part, and also the policy and regulation. Uh, so I think that this, this initial uh, session has been uh, concluded, let's say, because then next, the next one will be a little bit more related to what I was uh, mentioned before, which is the, uh, let's say, a little bit more the legal, um, uh, let's say perspective and we will have uh, in fact a lawyer that will uh, address specifically let's say how uh, the different uh, legal instrument can be used to foster and to, to strengthen let's say this, this, this joint effort uh, to, to work combating uh, uh, let's say cyber threats specifically for children. So uh, if you have questions um, to be addressed to the, to the speakers at least for this part I mean uh, we are obviously free to do that and then uh, uh, we will go. We will go for the next uh, for the next uh, section of the session. So, do you have questions? Two. Okay. Lady at the back. Yeah. 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 Um, of course, Gerardo Cassini. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, in the we we had a meeting with parliamentarians in May in Geneva. In fact, the issue of um, child abuse images on in the internet, and child abuse, as you said, is, is, is a shared is a shared mm -hmm. uh, concern. Uh, but uh, the the concern from uh, many parliamentarians, um, and I think uh, you also. Are, underline this uh, this point is that um, the legal instruments are not uh, are not there but there is a need to let's say share even the legal instruments um, 
there is a problem of capacity in, in many countries. And uh, to be even exposed, and in many parliaments, to be exposed to other legislation, existing legislation, um, which is a normal uh, way of doing. When, when we prepare documents, many times we cut and paste. And in legislation, this can happen, uh, actually, across countries. So I think there is also there must be an effort in, in, in really building capacities on how to um, legislate and what kind of legislation is needed mm. uh, from uh, either from parliament or government. Mm. So um, you, you said it in already, mm. but um, I want just to share this, uh, mm. this uh, concern that was um, mentioned to us <laughs> in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm Chong Yi Kim from Republic of Korea, and I'm intern at ITU. Um, I want to uh, special thank you for ITU and Diplo for supporting I'm here. Actually, I have two questions for speakers. Maybe it's quite, quite um, a little bit specific questions. Um, uh, we were talking about child of images, and we are, we are talking about how difficult we have, how difficult you know each country has different laws and um, policies against the child pornography. Uh, I want to ask you about virtual child pornography. I know some countries that um, virtual child pornography is just contents, uh, legal contents. Uh, so, um, how about EU? The EU support uh, virtual child pornography as illegal contents or legal contents, and uh, what is the policy or strategy, uh, strategy plan against the child abuse, uh, virtual child abuse uh, graphic? And then my second question is for Mr. Ka. Uh, among your uh, speakers' speeches, you mentioned that uh, in United UK you have a list and, and uh, normal you know, people cannot access the list you know, which is served provide uh, illegal child abuse images. But that means the website, if the website provides uh, illegal contents, that means the website itself is illegal. Yeah. So uh, what does that mean? I, I'm, I'm not, okay. I cannot understand the people okay. cannot, if people cannot uh, access the website, and then the website is illegal anyway. Yeah. What that means? Sorry. So I mean, okay. I got it. the reason why I ask you is because the uh, uh, service provider, internet service provider, or content provider can uh, can change the contents any very easily. Yeah. So that's that's my got question. It. Thank you. I'll I'll deal with the second point first because it's uh, obviously my fault for not being clearer. <laughs> There's almost zero child pornography, uh, child abuse images, child pornography published on websites in the United Kingdom. Over well, o almost every single one is overseas. And so we, what happens is that the IWF identifies it as an illegal website under English law, uh, under UK law, and it notifies the police force in the country concerned where it's identified it. But it's then up to the police force in that country to act to remove it. Because obviously the IWF, which is in s simply a British institution, cannot send a notice to a Polish or an American or a Mexican ISP saying, please remove this illegal website. It communicates directly with the police in that country. Now the problem is that the police forces in many of these different countries um, don't act very quickly to, to get the site taken down or don't do anything at all. So uh, the, the, the blocking list simply is a list of the web addresses, irrespective of which country they're in. None of them are in Britain. I mean, we don't need to block access to illegal websites in Britain because if any were identified, they would be gone within 60 minutes. The list is entirely of websites which are overseas, which are outside of, of the UK, uh, over which, therefore, we have no direct control. Now, it's, I mean, it's another aspect of the problem, in other words, because we've identified them as illegal websites, we've identified them as containing illegal material, but the police forces in the countries where these sites exist can vary hugely in the length of time it takes them to get it removed. I mean, there's been at least one uh, website uh, which 12 months after 
we notified the police in that country that it existed, it is still up and it is still visible 12 months later. Um, your first question, I'll just say something briefly, I don't know if uh, Dieter's going to speak on it as well. Uh, there are a number of countries where it is, uh, virtual child pornography is not illegal. Uh, the United States is the most important one where it is not illegal. The decision, there was a case that went to the United States Supreme Court, so it's going to be quite difficult to get this decision changed. It will require, I think, the S Supreme Court to reverse itself, and I hope it will. But it was Ashcroft and the a ACLU about five years ago, uh, and essentially what the Supreme Court said was, unless the image shows actual illegal acts being performed on actual children, no crime has been committed. Or to put it another way, the basis on which an, illegal, an image is illegal under US federal law is that it depicts actual harm being done to an actual child. Now, just to be clear, under US law, you could still be prosecuted under the obscenity laws, but the standard and the test for, for, for a conviction under the obscenity laws is obviously harder to establish than it is if it's a simply a child pornography offence. Normally, in most jurisdictions, child pornography is illegal ir irrespective of any particular test of community standards or whatever, which is what you have to apply in obscenity cases. So this was a very bad result because, um, and it's had a bad impact on the extent to which the police in different countries can cooperate. In the United Kingdom and in most other countries, we make no distinction between virtual child pornography and actual child pornography. If it looks like child pornography, we treat it as if it were child pornography, and it's not necessary for us to establish whether it is virtual or real. Now, the defense, if, 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 if a person is accused uh, of possessing it, the defense can prove in court that it is virtual child pornography rather than real child pornography, and under the sentencing guidelines, what that means is that the sentence that you would have received is stepped down by one notch. We, we, grade, we grade child pornography in five different categories. So if you're, if you're found with level five, that's the highest level of images. That's the worst kind of image. And they're all virtual images rather than real ones. You will be sentenced as if you were in possession of level four. If you're, if you're caught with level three and they're all virtual, you'll be sentenced as if it was level two, and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, when, when, the, when these guys go looking for the images, they don't sort of sit down and say to themselves, ah, I won't download that image because it's a real one. I will download this image because it's a virtual one. You know, to the guys who are interested in child pornography, the distinction between virtual and real is completely meaningless. They, they just get any images of, which depict uh, child sex abuse. Uh, and I think, therefore, the dis and, and the impact and effect of the images is identical. Let, let's be clear, by the way, that for, for an image to be classified as being virtual child pornography, it has to be essentially indistinguishable from a real image. If it was a cartoon or if it was a drawing, that wouldn't count. Virtual child pornography means it's a photographic image or an image of photographic quality depicting child sexual abuse uh, activity. So I think it, the, the distinction is wholly bogus, wholly wrong, and the sooner that can be eliminated from legal systems around the world, the better. Thank you. Dieter, you want to say a few words? And just I believe in the European Union right now there's a discussion going on actually including definitions of virtual child sexual abuse material to become uh, illegal. Uh, but right now there's no instrument as such. And as John just mentioned, um, having the US not being in favor of defining virtual pornography or virtual child abuse images as being illegal, it, uh, it makes it a big difference. I can mention Japan has taken action on this. And I believe right now, uh, I think 1st of December, 1st November, or very recent, I think they passed a law uh, that basically condemns um, virtual child sexual abuse of material. Um. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I want just to add a little note on this. And uh, I, again, uh, I mean, this is another example on where 
we really need to go for something a little bit more harmonized. I mean, we really need to get, uh, let's say, the different communities, specifically the different countries, adopting common principle that can be used, I mean, as, a, mm. let's say, a possible uh, modelization of the legal requirement that are necessary to, to address specific issues. I mean, this is something that has been uh, around since several years, and um, maybe now, I mean, with all these other elements, specifically on child online protection that are emerging, I mean, uh, there is really a need to try to have this uh, global movement toward uh, a little bit more harmonized, um, harmonized approach. Uh, as I mentioned, there are lots of, uh, we are going to hear from, from Adam, there are several different uh, regional frameworks that are in place. There are very, very good national laws. But uh, since now cybercrime is transnational, I mean, it's cross-cutting, it's cross-border, I mean, you can really define, I mean, what, what is the limit? I mean, what is the, the line, you know, between one country and, and another? And again, this is something that I strongly believe uh, the, interna the international community has to address. Uh, specifically United Nations because I mean uh, just within this uh, uh, let's say kind of a consensus building process I mean we may be able to address properly so uh, I would like to get you know Adam you just come here I think you can be here as well I mean, without changing so uh, because they will be the only one if you want okay. to. so maybe then we can have another little uh, yeah. okay also you want to Okay. Okay. Maybe you can be here, as yeah. you prefer. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. For me, I mean, yeah, I mean, we are really informed. <laughs> That's no problem. Mm. Yeah. You ready? No. Uh, Marco, as Marco said, um, Adam Mambi, I'm working with the Tanzania Communication Regulatory Authority as a senior legal officer. Um, I've also been teaching at the University of Dar Salaam the subject of cyber law, intellectual property law, and competition law. Um, as you can see from the, the program, um, I'm, my discussion is focusing on the um, legal issues. What are the legal measures as far as children protection are concerned? If you look at the structure of my presentation, I have divided my presentation in the following parts. First of all, uh, we'll be looking at the legal implications of digital technology. What are the issues? What is the impact of ICT to children? We'll also be looking at the e-children pornography under the digital era, which has been mentioned by, by my colleagues. What is the scope of the problem? We can look at some of the data. What are the dangers our children face when they are involved online? Um, who are the exploiters? Who are the predators? We need to know them. How to identify these, these offenders? Um, we can also have practical case study on e-identification problem. There is a problem with identification. What are the legal issues? Are there any judicial responses? or cases, what's the role of intermediaries, uh, ISP, OSPs, what's the legal basis for intermediaries' liability? So there are so many issues like um, how to draft the laws, why cyber laws might lack enforceability, yeah, we'll see the reason. And then we can also consider the existing international legal instruments that deal with child pro protection. What are the legal challenges on jurisdiction problem when we, we, when, when we are trying to enforce these laws? Um, a little bit on electronic evidence and the suggested solutions. So those are the areas, if we'll have enough time. If you don't have enough time, tomorrow we'll have the, the, the same discussion. Um, when we talk of inter internet governance, we should not forget these issues. You can see those are the issues that we need to consider. You are talking of e-commerce, cyber crimes, e-security, data protection, um, child grooming, cyber stalking, um, e-identification. We're also talking of e-gambling, e-jurisdiction problem. Those are the things to, to, to take in, your, in our minds. Uh, but let me start my, let me go straight forward to my, my, my presentation. 
Um, I'm just trying to look at the implication of ICT to our children. What is technology doing? Um, I think we are all aware that technology or digital technology has facilitated the, the recording, transmission and storing of images and text on digital media. I think this is obvious. People are just uplo uploading, people are just downloading these kind of images. So that's obvious, we all know. Um, so um, if you look at the, what ICT is doing um, to our children, ICT is trying to make children to learn, play, and communicate. They can learn, they can play, they can communicate. But internet plays a major role in, chil in, in chil child sexual exploitation. So it's trying to play the ma major role when you talk of child sexual exploitation. And this is done through wherever you find that internet can enable offenders to, tar to target children, individual or collectively. That's what is happening. Internet is used to distribute homemade and commercial child pornography. Think about peer-to-peer um, -peer networks. That's uh, what ICT is doing to our children. And of obviously, young person or children, these are the most vulnerable of these illegal activities. They are always at risk. They can be harmed by child pornography, by being exposed to child pornography, or they are being filmed electronically. If you look at some of the data from, from various sources, you can see uh, F FBI is saying that over 50% of all child pornography says in the U.S. indicates boys rather than girls. I'm not sure if this is true. I just found it in the internet. If you look at a Canadian custom, they are saying 75%. That's in, in found in Canada. Of course, if you look in early 1970s, Denmark, Holland were the main centers of production in Europe. Germany, UK followed by that time. Just if you look at just that, um, that figure, you find that 44% um, is child pornography. So it's, it's, it's the largest image production electronica. This is uh, child pornography compared to adult pro, uh, pornography. That's a source from U.S. General Accounting Office. You can also see the dangers uh, that children face online. These are the dangers. They can be exposed to inappropriate and harmful materials such as obscene, drugs, and alcohol. So those are the dangers children that can face. You have so many dangers you can read on your own. These are, are normal dangers. Cyber, you, you have sexual solicitation, you have hate speech, you have cyber stalking, you have e-defamation, you have cyber bullying. Those are the dangers that can be faced by our children online. But do we have legal measures or laws to cater for this child ERB? That's the question I'm posing there. If you look at those dangers, do you have the laws? We need to consider on that. Again, what is the legal definition of a child and child pornography? I think this has been discussed by one of my colleagues. That if you look at the definition of a child itself, laws, national laws, and international conventions, we find there is a di difference. The definition varies. Others are saying it's under 16. Others are saying it's under 18. Others under 13. But of course, if you look at the um, international conventions, it's under 18. So there is that difference. Again, the word child pornography has been differently defined, as my colleagues may say that. So if you have those differences in, in terms of definition, then you, you might have problem. If you look at um, uh, Canadian penal code, the Canadian law, they say that a minor for child pornography is just a person under 18 years. So that's the definition. Um, there are so many laws. You can look at your own time at the way they have defined child pornography. For instance, the U.S. Child Pornography Prevention Act, their defini definition goes further by saying that is any child pornography which is produced by enemies. 
I have underlined the word enemies, whether it's a physical or E, so that definition is covered. There is also the definition of EU Convention for Cybercrime 2001. You'll see the, 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 the child is, is a person under 18 years of age. So you have such kind of differences. Uh, if you look at Commonwealth, the, we have Commonwealth model laws. That was the bill on computer and computer-related crimes. They also have the definition of child pornography. So you can read that on your own. But more important, important that model law defines the word publish. It's very important to define the word publish so that it can cover e-publication. As you can see, the way the, the model has defined the word publish. Again, who are the, who are the offenders of our children? Or who are the offenders of our children electronically? These are the offenders. The producers, middlemen, uh, distributors, sex tourists, and those, and those uh, the other, other, other offenders. I'm not sure if you are also, if you are the consumers or the producers of this kind of illegal images. But again, how to identify these offenders is, is always a problem. The question of anonymity under cyberspace identifying these offenders or children who are being uh, affected. Because there is one saying in, in, um, in, the, in the internet environment that in the internet or cyber, cyberspace, nobody knows you are a dog. You don't know with whom are you communicating. He might be a dog or something else. So it's somehow very difficult to identify. <laughs> 